So um, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite topics, and that is failure. <laughs> and now I want to be very clear: um, you do not want to fail. Okay? It's um, but given that uh, you will definitely fail many times. Um, if you don't, that's amazing. Uh, but given that, it'll be about how we fail and what we learn from it that will make us better and stronger and better uh, and greater in greater and different ways. Uh, so I thought I would just share with you nine lessons. It's actually nine sets of lessons, so it's not, it's a little misleading, but if I were to say there's 37 lessons from failure, no one would come if they think it's a long talk. <laughs> so um, so I, I think I'm gonna skip through this because I think you already know uh, about me. I was born in Vietnam, came to the US when I was a little kid, so I'm a ref uh, son of refugees, studied and uh, went to school there, and I dropped out of MIT to start my first company, and then sold it, uh, started the second one, at the, and most recently uh, started uh, Misfit, uh, a wearable technology company, and we, uh, we sold that recently to uh, Fossil about a year ago, big watch company, so that's my background. Um, so let me cover nine different categories. Uh, hiring, uh, big, I, hope, I don't know if this works from a, one try. Um, hiring uh, is one of the most important things you can do as an entrepreneur. By the way, just real quick uh, survey of the audience. How many, how many students, full-time students right now? Okay, and how many entrepreneur, uh, how many people doing startups? Work, how many people are working for a startup or starting a company? So same, same. okay. Um, how many people looking, already have a startup and looking for funding? Okay, roughly same, similar kind of, okay. And how many investors, or non, non like investors in here? No, okay. <laughs> um, all right, so it's good uh, just to get a good sense of the room. Um, so I'm gonna to try to be as specific, and hopefully you don't find it too prescriptive, but I, I've always found that uh, conference talks are usually incredibly useless and boring. So I'm gonna try not to be either one and try to be as useful as possible. So if it comes off as prescriptive, I'm sorry, but I'm just uh, gonna share with you stuff that I've learned. So, um, <laughs> so, So hiring and desperation, I feel like I've learned, I've, um, I'm trying to turn up the volume here. Uh, hmm. Oh, maybe it's on maximum already. Yeah. You think it's on maximum? I'm just So I do have sound on here. No? You want me to turn your computer yeah. off? Uh, uh, no, to crank up the sound. Crank up the sound, okay. Yeah. Let me just connect it to the console. Okay. Even better. All right, technical challenges here. Um, yeah, don't hire in desperation. Some of my worst uh, hires were in desperation. Uh, you think, oh my gosh, I have to have this person or I'm dead. Get the nearest person who can do marketing or firmware engineering or whatever. And uh, almost without fail, uh, we've had, ter I, I've never been lucky with it where we just happen to get a good hire. Um, so don't do it. Um, hiring for strength instead of a lack of weaknesses, very important. Okay, it's very easy to say, well, there's nothing wrong with this person, so yeah, we'll take them. What a terrible way to hire. Okay, don't do it. Uh, I've, again, uh, one of the fastest way to hire mediocre people if you, uh, if you follow that path. Uh, so hire for, for enormous strength, someone who's just ridiculously good at something instead of um, uh, the fact that they just not horrible at anything. Uh, uh, and probably one of the, my favorite lessons I've learned from uh, my, uh, one of our mentors, John Scully, only work with people you like. Uh, that was something he told us uh, early on, and I, always, I never took it seriously until a few years into Misfit, a couple years in, because I thought, well, you're John Scully, everybody wants to work with you. Um, so, uh, it, you know, uh, so you can say that. And I realized that actually we all have choices, and uh, you can actually uh, make the choice not to uh, work with p people you don't like. Remember, your co-founders, your first employees, they are, you're, you're gonna spend more time with them than your family, without a doubt. Okay, so you need to like them and just be uncompromising about it. If there's any suspicion you're not gonna like somebody, just 
just just wait. You know, it's not worth it. It's not worth the years of pain and heartache and uh, that you will experience by working with people you just can't stand. Or even if you, there's something that you just really don't like about that person, don't put up with it. Okay. Um, you, you, there's plenty of opportunities out there, plenty of great team members. Um, so that's the first three things about hiring, about the how. Uh, things that I just learned by not doing those things. Um, on the who side, uh, you, you know, I mentioned this a little bit in, my, uh, in the talk earlier. Um, my first company, we, hired, we, we had Google style interview question, brain teasers. And like I said, we, we hired some incredibly smart people from MIT and Caltech and the NSA. And they, we just had a lot of social problems. Um, and egos and not team members. So uh, we realized it's actually about skills, not really relevant skills, not just IQ. Uh, we realized that uh, in, it's not just about hiring for experience, but people who have great judgment. Uh, I'm sure you know someone in your life who is just right about a lot of stuff, you know? And you know, when they say stuff, you're like, oh my God, he's, you know, okay, we better listen to him because uh, he knows what he's talking about. Or, you know, she, every time she opens her mouth, it's totally right. You know, those are th these are people with great judgment, uh, or uh, maybe you could call it great wisdom. Uh, and so, and they don't always come with a lot of experience. Sometimes it's tied to experience, but not always. Okay, and um, and I'll give you a quick tip on how to interview for some of this in just a bit. Um, and finally, cultural fit above all. Finding someone who really fits in with the crew uh, is so important, and because defining having a very strong sense of culture early. Um, it's hard for if you're a first-time entrepreneur because you haven't really figured out what you what works and what doesn't. It's okay. Um, take a shot at something in terms of what you think is important to you. Okay, but keep it to like one or two things and then build on that. It's okay that your culture will evolve. It should evolve as you as you grow. Um, but uh, yeah, the this fit is 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 really important and. Um, I, uh, it's something, it took me a couple of startups to learn to not compromise on. Um, it's, uh, and I'll get into a little bit more in just a bit. One of my favorite quotes from a, a favorite philosopher, the, the problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves. And wiser people are so full of doubts. And that's so true, you know. Um, in my previous company, you know, we had, um, you know, it was always the loud people who got listened to. I couldn't stand it, you know? It was always the brilliant introverts who would sit there in the corner, never say anything, and they were always the ones who were right, you know? And, uh, and so at Misfit, we always tried to have a, build a culture around listening, just, all right, everybody shut up, uh, let's listen to the introverts, you know? And it, I mean, we didn't always do that, but the idea was uh, um, having that open heart to listen to folks who aren't always the loudest. But I mean, by human nature, we listen to the loudest people, you know? So, um, so skills, not just IQ, wisdom, not just experience, and cultural fit above all. Three things to keep in mind, three things I learned, again, the hard way. Um, values, you know, there's a lot of talk about va values, and well, you know what, it's important. So uh, let me talk a little bit about that. Mention a little bit about Enron. Um, this is like carved in stone in their lobby, okay? Communication, having an obligation to respect and integrity. I mean, these are pretty solid, you know, stone uh, values, right? Well, it didn't work, uh, obviously, um, because um, these are, I, I suspect one of the reasons why is they didn't infuse it in the culture, but the other reason is I think that the, these values are just too vague. You know, they don't drive decision, uh, they don't drive decisions. Um, the, uh, uh, they're not very incisive, they're not specific enough. Um, and, and so uh, I, I'll give you some examples of um, value statements where I think are a little bit more, uh, that I think are more useful. Now, uh, but before I get to that, the last point is how do you get uh, the, the values out there, right? Um, if, uh, for like, for example, one of our things was, uh, you know, the, the story I told earlier about uh, servant leadership, so, uh, having a spirit of self-sacrifice for your, for the team members, how do you do that? And we did it with these stories, with the, you know, the 
the upgrade story, you know, like the, if you get upgraded, you always have to uh, give up your seat to the most junior person. When we travel and, you know, there's not enough beds, the most senior person takes the floor and it's automatic. And when those stories get out, they're powerful and people remember them. And so uh, if you're going to have values, make sure you communicate them, make sure you reward them so that people know that it, it's valued in the company and uh, communicate through stories so that people understand, can relate to it in an emotional way. Um, recognizing and rewarding people with shared values is also very important. That's how you know, these things get implemented. Um, and just to give you an example, and again, these were just values that we put in at Misfit. They are by no means some absolute standard, like you, you should have these same values. No, you should have your own values, you know, because you, the, 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 it has to be things that you believe in. Um, the first one was be a misfit. That means you got to do things differently. Uh, so uh, one way we implemented it was whenever we had a big decision, we uh, and we came to a to a to a conclusion. Um, we would ask ourselves, is that a misfit thing to do? Is that really different, or are we just going to do? Are we just doing something someone else did? And um, whether that's some viral marketing campaign or. Um, the way we uh, advertise job postings, like our job postings, people love them, um, are very, you know, what, if you go to misfit.com slash jobs, you, you'll see how we, we say what we're looking for um, and what we provide in return. And we say, um, you know, amazing work environment, cool coworkers. We actually say in, I think, the second or the last line, a very prominent line, that we will definitely pay you below market rate. Okay. We will pull out, uh, but with lots of potential upside. And so that weeded out, I mean, people who were just looking for a paycheck, uh, getting a raise, for example. Because it's true, I mean, you know, when you work for a startup, you're going to be paying less than what a big company could pay. Um, so that was a pretty misfit thing to do. Being thoughtful, thinking before you talk, so that, to tr again, to try to counteract that, you know, the loud person gets heard culture. Um, uh, thinking through code, if you're going to write code, cut document it well so that you could save the next person time. So that was very important for us. Uh, one of my favorite ones uh, was do more with less. So whatever you do, whether it's a new feature or a new thing, make sure that it can, um, that, uh, you, you can perform more than one function, for example, or, um, or just take out the feature. So we had this magnet for the shine. The shine was the activity tracker that we made, and it could clip and clip on your shirt, and you could wear it that way with the magnet. But the magnet could also be used to remove the battery. You know, it had a third use, actually. It, could, it was used to close the box that the product came in because we put a piece of metal there. And uh, so, you know, doing more with less. And that was one example there. Um, and this is an important value because it's not just about spending less money. It's actually being more thoughtful th about design about, and also about how you spend money and expend resources. So this became a very core value to Misfit. Uh, you know, again, like I said, it's not about being cheap. It's about being smart about what, what your design. And finally, be a servant leader. This was probably our most controversial uh, value. A lot of, it turned off a lot of people. It's fine. Uh, but the people who, it, uh, who got excited about it really stuck with us for a long time because they were like, yes, I want to be a part of a company where uh, other people will be uh, self-sacrificing because I'm going to do the same. And I hope others will be, be, be that way as well. And you know, when you have a whole collect, collection of people who, who are like that, it works. So, you know, the very, the fairly specific uh, um, values. And it took us, you know, a, uh, we had the first two and then we added the third one like two years in and then, then we had the first two and the third one and the fourth one and then we added the third one uh, a few years in uh, into the company. Now, uh, what do you do when you find an amazingly high performing person who doesn't uh, share your values, right? Uh, we had an amazing, uh, like a really, like a great sales guy and just totally was not a servant leader. I expected everybody to serve him because he was the bomb. He was an amazing sales guy. Um, well, according to Jack Welch, um, you, the, the, what you do with uh, the, the other folks are fairly obvious, but people who deliver on their commitments, deliver on their numbers, don't show your values, seek them out and remove them. Wow, you know, and that sounds like, wow, what a hard decision. Actually, it should be a very easy decision because they, um, they, these folks have the potential to have the most influence in your organization and will change the culture of your organization most easily because they're, they could easily garner respect. So, um, 
I totally, you know, so it was actually a very easy decision to let the, the sales guy go. Um, so uh, yeah, three points there on, uh, on culture, creating values that drive decisions, reinforce them with stories, and re reward based on these values. Uh, this is very t closely tied to culture. Okay, there's another term, kind of a vague term that gets thrown a lot, around a lot. So let's examine what that actually means. The customs and beliefs, art, way of life, and social organization of a particular country or group. The beliefs and attitudes of something that people in a particular group or organization share. Super important, okay? Um, and there's, um, uh, you know, we can talk about values until we're blue in the face. But uh, pardon the, the, the pun, but culture trumps values. Um, and so there's actually a book uh, on this, or an article that has some studies on, on this. It seems very, uh, again, uh, almost um, fluffy, but uh, there are studies about why this is very important. Um, setting the culture early uh, is very important. Um, the first 50 people pretty much define, once, once you're at about 50 people, <clears throat> your company's not gonna really change in really fundamental ways unless there's some radical moves that you make. Um, again, this is um, hiring and firing based on culture, not just performance. Talked about that just, uh, just a bit ago. And finally, my, one of my favorite things that uh, John uh, has talked to me about uh, early on, you know, it's not about work-life uh, balance. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of people ask about that. It's really about work-life integration. And uh, um, it's, uh, you know, when you're doing a startup, it's, it's an all-in kind of thing, you know. Uh, uh, expecting to have work-life balance is just not, it's not, I, I don't think it's a really reasonable thing to, to, does it mean you're just working all the time? No. But does that mean it really becomes an in, intrinsic part of your life, this thing that you do, this startup, this baby? Yes. Um, all right, people. Okay, uh, are you guys familiar with this photograph, what, what this is? Does anyone know what it is? The guys from LinkedIn, uh, from PayPal. That's right, this is the PayPal Mafia. So these are the guys, the first 13 or whatever employees of, of PayPal, uh, the, pay, the payment service. That's uh, Peter Thiel, Max Levchin, Keith Rubber, um Reed Hoffman, there's a bunch of th these guys, you know, um, and after PayPal, they went on to start probably each one of these guys that all went on to start incredible companies. You know, Max went on to start a bunch of companies, including Glow and Affirm. Keith went on to work with, with uh, Square and Twitter. Uh, Reed went on to start LinkedIn. I mean, an, an amazing uh, set of people. Uh, this is, a, you know, this, it's the PayPal mafia, right? Um, so people, uh, it's about, um, I, I think there's like no greater joy. You know, people say, what's the coolest thing about doing a startup? I think one of my favorite things is watching people grow. Uh, startup life is going to be one of the most transformative uh, types of experiences you'll ever have. And it'll be one of the most ex transformative experiences that uh, the people who work with you will have. And so focusing on maximizing the potential of every person. This, I don't know if you know this photograph. It's, it's this guy who goes around and gives people free haircuts in London. And uh, you know that's before and after pictures of uh, a bunch of homeless people. And um, I, I love this guy's uh, Instagram. It's just amazing. And it's an amazing story of how small things you can do uh, for people can really transform uh, the course of someone's life. Um, Honest two-way feedback, uh, I think, is, is, is it was a, something that we did at, at, at all three of my companies, and it was just like one of the best things ever. Um, and we had this process, and if you email me, I, I, I can send you the template, but we had uh, this process called, uh, well, it, we used to call it uh, cluelessness, uh, but then we made it more professional. We call it bilateral feedback. And basically, we would meet. Um, yeah, once, uh, once a month or once every two months, and um, uh, we would give feed one-way feedback to each other. Meaning, like if Vasily would give me feedback, Sonny, you talk too much, I can't respond. That was the key, and then I could give him feedback and say, Vasily, you need to shower more, <laughs> and um, and he can't give feedback. Uh, and we would uh, take that, and uh, the only time we could give feedback would be at the next session, which would be six weeks away. And uh, 
we've, we, you know, that was our process for feedback. But having a, 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 a feedback process that was safe and uh, regular, okay, you can't have impromptu feedback. Like, I need, we need to have a feedback session. <laughs> that means I'm just going to be, I'm angry at him and I'm just going to give him feedback, which means I'm just going to yell at him. Not good. So um, having it regular so that it's not impromptu, two-way, um, and we require this from every manager and their direct reports. Uh, and it's, I felt it was totally transformative. Um, I hated the sessions because I didn't want to hear critical stuff, but uh, it was just like, uh, it's one of the most valuable, the, you know, they say that candor is one of the most valuable things you can give to people. Was there also positive feedback? I'm sorry? Was there also positive feedback? Yeah, yeah, so we, we took a, 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 a five to one rule, which was, yeah, you start with by giving three to five, maximum five, at least three, uh, positive pieces of feedback uh, with specific examples and then followed by one constructive, at most one, at most and at, at least, so one uh, constructive feedback. Um, and then with specific examples. So like I said, there's a whole process that, that we refined over the course of literally 15 years. Uh, Shreda and I, we were doing this since college and we brought it with us through all of the startups and it was just, I thought it was really helpful. Could uh, a manager also get feedback from a low, lower level? So it was especially designed for that. So manager and direct reports, so every manager we had had to have a uh, bilateral feedback with every one of their direct reports. And that's what makes it hard. And then peer level f direct, uh, feedback was also encouraged but not required. So the VP of engineering could have feedback session with a VP of HR or that kind of thing. Um, you know, letting people fail, uh, one of the defining things of ha doing a startup in Silicon Valley, it's very important that uh, people are able to do that, uh, having a culture. So at, Mi at Misfit, we threatened, but we never actually acted on it. But we said, if you didn't fail significantly on something within your first year, you would uh, you'd be terminated. Um, we never followed through with that, but, you know, it was kind of a cool thing to say at orientation. <laughs> um, but we, we were trying to get the point across that this was something that we, we, we valued. Um, and so as a manager, uh, you had a, almost this requirement to produce, uh, allow people to have a situation where they could potentially fail, and, but you could catch them. Uh, so um, one of my favorite quotes from another great mentor, uh, also investor, early investor at, at Misfit, uh, people are usually limited. <laughs> Sorry. People are usually limited by what they attempt, not by what they are capable of. So this was apparently a Taiwanese national championship, <laughs> little league basketball game. And uh, so um, maximizing, so, what, so what's important about people development and team, right? Uh, maximizing the potential of every person. So investing in training, like what startup talks about training? Right? It's about hiring the best people. It's like, well, no, sometimes you'll get like, pretty good people, but amazing cultural fit, but then training them to get them to be more productive and more effective, amazing investment. Okay? And it's something that I, hear, I hardly ever hear startups talk about, training programs. It's like something you do in a big corporate. Not true. Um, feedback and letting people fail. All right? I know I'm going through this fast. Any questions so far? Some great questions so far. Yep. All right, feel free to interrupt, okay? This is uh, supposed to be interactive. Um, the environment, okay. So um, I think the secret is about making work not feel like work. Um, and then that is, uh, and so how do you do that? Um, honestly, I, I don't have like some guiding principles or anything, but I'll share with you how we did it at Misfit. And I think we succeeded to some extent. I think we failed in a number of ways, but something, this is the early team, the early Misfit team. I think one of the most important things is, uh, is um, giving people work that gives them a sense of purpose. You know, that it's really, that the work is meaningful. Uh, if work is meaningful, purposeful, purposeful work, um, it doesn't feel like work. It does, it's, it's gonna be um, something that uh, will carry you through the terrible failures and the, the troughs that you will go through as a startup. When you don't get that customer, when you lose that key employee, when you don't get, the term sheet is terrible, or you don't get term sheets and you, you're almost out of money, or the partnership falls apart because we said something stupid, um, or, you know, like, any, oh, that's going to happen, right? Or we get sued, you know, big patent lawsuit. Um, but, you know, w when you have work that gives you a sense of purpose, it helps you power through that, helps your teams power through it. 
Um, work, working with people you like, super important. I uh, already talked about that. Um, and finally, don't laugh. Um, being surrounded by good food, it's pretty important. So we, we were very stocked. All the uh, stereotypes about Silicon Valley companies spending a lot of money on food, well, we lived up to it, <laughs> okay? And uh, it was worth it. The, the money is like, I mean, we didn't go crazy, you know, we didn't have like steaks every night or anything, but we, uh, you know, uh, within reason and, and uh, you know, so you get to work with, um, you get to work with people you like, it's purposeful work, and, um, and, you, and you've got unlimited amazing food all the time. And so, uh, yeah, we had coffee, but we had Red Bull. We had tons of Red Bull. So, because a lot of that's right. So, one of my another lesson from John Scully: one of the benefits of working at a startup is you get it to do things you're not qualified to, like this eight-year-old driving a bulldozer. Um, and uh, it's really true, you know. Like, who, what twenty-four-year-old gets to be VP of engineering of something? You know, I mean, the titles are kind of fake, anyways, when you're early on. But you know, a lot of them they, they will stay with that. Uh, those titles you, you, you keep for a long time. And so it's an amazing opportunity because you get to do things you're not qualified for. That's, you know, that's one of the benefits of a startup, right? Um, all right, let's talk about leadership. Uh, so far, any, like I said, feel free to interrupt. You know, I'm going through this pretty fast. Uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, about, lead, about uh, inspiration, right? If you want to build a ship, don't drum, up, don't drum up the men to gather would divide the work and give orders, instead teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. Um, again, it's about purpose at work. Um, when you lack that, it's going to be a, like no money, no, no pep talks. Uh, none of that can, can, can uh, overcome uh, lack of uh, purpose at work. Um, but when it comes to leadership, you know, a few tips that I've learned over the years. Uh, having strong opinions loosely held. You're going to have non-negotiables about what you believe in. There should be very few of those, okay? I, I, my opinion. Um, and, uh, and then pretty much I think everything else is negotiable, you know? Um, eternal words of Groucho Marx, those are my principles, and if you don't like them, well, I have others. So this is, uh, it's, uh, um, so uh, eat last, fly coach. You know, staying lean is one thing, right? Um, and having this mentality of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, you know, uh, that you don't have to be at the head of the line. In fact, that being at the end of the line, being the last, uh, is in fact uh, the coolest place to be because that's where you get to serve everybody else. That that is like if you can instill that kind of sense in the company that the first, that the last will be first, uh, kind of thing. Um, it, it'll, it's, it's a, I think it's, it helps you sustain uh, this, uh, this, uh, this kind of self-sacrificial culture for a long time. You know, look, if Obama can, you know, if, if he can be in coach, you know, uh, apparently Bill Gates flew coach like for years. Um, uh, if Warren Buffett can still eat McDonald's, you know, then, well, you know, then, then we all can as well. Um, st something I learned, uh, didn't learn fast enough, but uh, setting up for what you believe. Um, you know, I think early on in my career, I often deferred to kind of people with more experience. And sometimes it worked out right, but uh, there were definitely times when in my gut, I knew that there was a, the direction was wrong, and I didn't speak up. I didn't stand up for what I believed in. And uh, I, I regret it. I hate to say it. You know, people say life with no regrets. Well, it's not true. Sometimes there are stupid things you do and you wish you wouldn't have done them. And uh, Vinod used to told me once, and I, it's st stuck with me for a long time, that the regret that comes from doing something you shouldn't have is temporary. But the regret that comes from not doing something you <coughs> should have is inconsolable. And it's really, it's, it's very true. Um, so, uh, have strong opinions, loosely held, eat last, fly coach, stand up for what you believe. Product. We talked a little bit about this uh, this morning, so I'll go through this quickly, but you know, it's about thinking about the user first. It's not about asking, doing fo endless focus groups and asking people to do your job as a product designer. Uh, about the previous uh, thing that you said, stand up for what you believe. Yes. 
Uh, how can you make sure you're not being toxic? Um, I'm sorry? How can you make sure, uh, how can you define the line between being toxic and uh, standing up for what you believe? The line between toxic? Uh, uh, um, stubborn, maybe? Being stubborn? stubborn uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, um, oops. 30 minute marks. All right. Um, let me sit. Uh, that's a good question. Um, that's where I think feedback, the feedback loop comes in. Um, you know, uh, um, yeah, I think that's where feedback comes in because uh, you don't always know. You don't always know whether you're just being an ass or you're, you are, or you're not and you're right. And sometimes it's a little bit of both, right? Um, but having, but, you know, if you have an environment where someone, where you're, especially people really junior to you, can give you honest feedback, I think, uh, I think it, it can be important. And again, this is about the non-negotiables. There should be very few that are non-negotiables. Okay. Um, I'll skip over the product thing since we talked about it at length this morning. Uh, execution. It is definitely about. Um, this is a. Uh, you know, people always talk about ideas. Oh man, I have an awesome idea. This is going to be a billion dollar business. It's like, well, you know, ideas are not, they're actually not a dime a dozen as the, as the popular expression goes. They're actually free. There are websites where they will automatically generate ideas for you. There's a website called um, Y Combinator with a K.com and Nonstarter with no E.com and they both automatically generate ideas and apparently I think uh, Lyft uh, was was generated that way. There was like a couple, no, GitHub was generated that way. Uh, I, I believe they, someone went to one of these sites, automatically generated an idea, started the company. Oh, that's not a bad idea. They, they started the company. It is about execution. It's about being excellent at what you do, building an excellent product that has amazing product market fit, that delivers amazing, extraordinary value to your users, and building a brand and a culture that people fall in love with. You do all that, you know, it, you could literally just do just about any idea. Um, and as I mentioned this morning, it's, uh, uh, the, the focus really should be about building a, a great business, not just a great product. Um, we talked about le being lean this morning, which is, I'll skip through all this. Um, you know, uh, which is about you know, getting feedback and uh, iterating quickly, that kind of thing. Uh, but as, as far as building a business goes, it's, you know, it's about building a business, not just a product. And, it's, and one approach, as we discussed this morning, was about being lean. All right. And uh, in business, um, my favorite lesson I uh, learned from a, a recent mentor. Um, this is uh, Chairman Lee ka the richest man in Asia, uh, owns a good portion of Hong Kong. And uh, he uh, said, to give first and get later. Um, this seems like a nice thing to say, you know, uh, that you don't have to mean, but uh, it's actually true. Um, at net, whether it's at networking events, instead of going there with an attitude of like, oh, what can I get? What can I get from this? But uh, saying, hey, how can I contribute? Um, or when you, um, uh, I don't know, meet someone new, instead of thinking about what can I get from that person, but really thinking, hey, how can I improve the livelihood of that person? Or how can, what can I do to contribute? We're just asking the question, hey, how can I be helpful? Um, it just turns out that uh, it, it seems to work. And so something that uh, Chairman Lee had mentioned, and I always never forgotten it, is uh, always leave money ta on the table for the other side. So on the one side, about being helpful, and the other side, in, when, in doing, when in business, uh, not always trying to negotiate for that last penny not always trying to over-optimize for a deal, but saying, you know what? We both have to eat. We both have to be successful. You take that. And um, there are just some, I mean, I, I, there's some stories that are more confidential, but there are definitely times where I've kind of been the recipient of this graciousness that in business that like totally transformed the tenor of a, of a, um, of a relationship. Um, I'll tell you one story uh, where, uh, we were actually negotiating a term sheet with a VC, and the um, the new VC wanted a, a kind of a crazy term, a, a kind of a non-favorable term. 
and uh, actually, on the, it's, it's Horizons. They, they were they uh, invested in our Series B, and they asked for something that you know none of us really liked, but I was willing to go along with it, and our investors were willing to support it. And we signed the term sheet, we um, with this term, and we still didn't feel good about it. We're just like, okay, fine. But you know, they had every right to execute on the on the deal as is. And uh, at the last minute, I actually came back to them and I said, look, this is ridiculous. I, we should just close the deal. You should wire your funds. But would you reconsider and take that term out? You don't have to, obviously, because I've already, there are binding legal documents <laughs> at this point, you know, that uh, I have to go along with if I were to do this deal. And we're almost out of money, right? And um, they actually gave it to us. I mean, there's never, I've never seen any VC ever do that. Um, they did. It was, and I came back, and like literally, the entire board was floored that, <laughs> that this happened. And they're like, "What did you do? You're so convincing." I'm like, "No, no, no." <laughs> they were just amazingly gracious. They practiced this principle, leaving money on the table for the other side, and it just like their influence. Like every time their board member said something at the board meeting, everybody shut up and you know, okay, let's listen to Jason or Francis or whoever it was that was representing Horizons, and uh, the influence that that got them. The credibility, just you know, priceless. So I know I went through that really fast, but uh, I wanted to spend a lot of time to really think about uh, to answer questions. It's a lot of information about hiring, about people, culture, leadership, um, and usually I end up with with the what's the most important thing that you have to do, and it's sales. We talked about it this morning, so. Um, the gentleman right there. I have a more general question. So, uh, because I was also your morning speech, one of the things that you just talked about mistakes and failures. But is there any sample of information of failures you follow in order to acquire this experience for your personal interest? Um, so, were there failures that we had, like concrete? Failures to that. I mean, uh, was there any? Because I remember it's coming from a quote that smart people are learning from their mistakes, but more intelligent people learn from the mistakes of other people. Yep, yep. Did you uh, follow this uh, philosophy in order to um, reduce your mistakes? You know, I mean, yeah, we, um, I, I have some examples of where, where that happened, but I think um, learning from your own mistakes are very, are probably the most impactful, like, you know, sometimes you have to fail before you really learn something. Like, you know, they always say um, you should, uh, like, what's a common thing? Um, uh, you know, like, we learned very early on. It wasn't like a new invention that culture is really important. But now uh, we should really hire that guy. He was an amazing salesperson. I'm sure we can change him, right? When was the last time we heard that? And um, so we fell for it. And uh, we didn't listen to conventional wisdom, and he nearly wrecked the company, you know, because everybody else started to say, "Well, he's, you know, like I, maybe I should be like that." And you know, yeah, um, yeah. So that was that was that, that's an example of where we didn't listen to, to it, that we had to learn, like you know, because we knew that you shouldn't hire people who don't match with you in terms of culture, but we compromised. Um, and so that was one of those things where we had to learn from experience. And now it's like very easy to, like, I, I, that's not even an easy, a hard decision anymore. My question is about equity, and I'm curious mm. to find out how did you decide how to split equity at the early stages, and down the line when you started raising funds, how did that uh, change, <coughs> maybe mistakes along the way? The equity, yeah, man, that's um, so. Um, uh, equity. So I'm trying to think. What's a specific? Were there failures in equity distribution? Say. How did you? When you had several members of the team, like how did you decide to get so much? Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's a really good algorithm for that. Um, and you're bound to make mistakes. I mean, the number of startups I know where they're like one founder runs off with a ton of equity, and then you have to solve it because now they they don't want to work together. But then you have to solve it, or else they won't get any money. It's almost like this prisoner's dilemma kind of thing, right? Um, and um, 
So I, I would just say one guiding principle is just be really careful about choosing your founder. My general um, recommended bar is unless you've known someone for at least five years, sounds ridiculous, sorry, I just five years, uh, and you've gone through a difficult time with them and, and it was a good, and you, good outcome, then consider them for a founder, you know, um, or get as close to that as possible. Uh, Shrita and I have been to, through ridiculous, terrible times together, ran out of money, paid salaries on credit cards, and then ran out of credit limit, you know, um, trying to float our first, com our second company together, which, and then we ended up doing really, doing pretty well for, with that company. Man, he's ideal founder material, you know. Um, but it's it's hard, you know, when you're doing your first startup. But just take that extra time to do that. Um, in terms of equity distribution between founders, um, I actually don't like symmetric splits because, uh, and actually for my second company, I insisted on an asymmetric split where the where Shridhar got more than me, a little bit more, so that the buck stops with somebody. So I, I kind of encourage non-symmetric splits. I don't think there's a obvious, there's a, I don't know that, I doubt that's a good, the best, of a best practice. Um, reserving uh, good chunks of equity for early employees, there, there are kind of uh, some best practices for that. You know, 10% uh, employee stock option pools, pretty common, and refreshing that over time. I love having refresh. I, so one of the things I like to do is I like to refresh it post-financing so that uh, investors have to buy into it as well, and that it's not just common shareholders have to eat everything. Usually they don't agree to that, but if they're really excited about you, they'll agree to it. So um, uh, let me get that guy since we talked earlier. Yep. Um, so <coughs> participants here in this event are like coming from engineering background. Mm. I come from managerial background. Uh, where do you think uh, someone from like business administration has an edge, or to put it better, where is it? What field of entrepreneurship is it better for a manager? Because engineers have a technical profile and like they can make their own stuff <laughs> while it's been, like. So what? Yeah, what? Uh, what's a good place for an MBA, right? Are, are, are we? Are us? Are, are us MBAs useful? <laughs> right? Uh, where can we add the most value? Great question. Um, and you'll see uh, kind of um, uh, prejudices on both sides. Some people are like, oh, I only want a technical co-founder, or no, I only want strong business founders, right? Um, I think uh, in the early start, early stage context, um, trade skills are important. Nice to have, like engineering, design, sales, whatever. Um, but over time, and it happens very quickly, I believe uh, I, I go back to what I mentioned this morning, and that is the most important role is sales. And so whether you're in engineering, design, or, or sales, whatever, you're going to be generally trying to convince people to do stuff. That's mainly your role. You know, If, if 100 people in, you're still the main coder, you know, that's probably not a good idea, a good use of your time. You probably you should be spending your time recruiting the top coders and recruiting the top designers or convincing a, an amazing team to work with you. And so, um, and that skill isn't necessarily exclusive, uh, you know, uh, mutually exclusive with engineering skills or managerial skills or whatnot. It's something that uh, you, ha you should, you know, uh, that, that you'll learn, uh, because you'll ha basically have to do it whether you like it or not. Um, this gentleman? Yeah, uh, so I imagine when you go in this, this kind of business, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine that you will compete with uh, Apple, Samsung, Nike. Do you go in there in the mindset that at some point you will be that big that you will sell? So um, do, you, do you go into a venture thinking you're going to sell it? Yeah. Um, trying to overtake them. So I think the main, uh, I think a, a, a good mentality to maintain is uh, to build a, a great company, a great standalone company. If you build a company for acquisition, that's, uh, what if you don't get acquired? <laughs> you know, you're screwed and all these people that you hired and convinced to leave their previous lives to join you are screwed too. No, you know, that's not so good. So, and also the most valuable companies to be acquired are the strongest standalone companies. You know, strong cash flow, strong product base, strong IP portfolio, strong team, 
that's very valuable for any company. I mean, those the standalone companies are, I think, the most valuable ones. Again, I mean, I'm just an entrepreneur. I'm not a VC, so maybe VCs in, in the audience would disagree with me. But uh, building for an acquisition, I think you're just asking for trouble. And it seems kind of a narrow thing to do, you know. Uh, now, uh, should I build a company, not get acquired, and like I want to be the next Apple? You could, you know. That's a choice you can make. Um, you know, but I, I can't give specific advice yeah, on that. But the VCs are pushing for an exit strategy. Yep. So you, even if you don't have a plan like that, you know, it seems like you're forced to come up with an idea. Yeah, I I don't know. Like the best VCs that I know, they never ask me that. What's your exit strategy? I'm like, I don't know. I'm gonna build a big ass company. <laughs> I mean, like, the, uh, I want to build an incredibly valuable company, and I don't know. Maybe we'll go IPO. Maybe Google will buy us. Maybe we'll overtake Google. I don't know. But like, yeah. But usually these are the guys that they come in afterwards. So there's, uh, you think at the first layer of the angels or uh, lower tier VCs that you can have access during the first stages. Mm -hmm. They're not like that, and, and they're hungry for the success. If, if, if an angel is, is needing and hungry for a financial exit, probably not the right kind of angel, you know? Okay. I mean, right? I mean, like go, go invest in gold or, or like, a, or, prospect, or go to Vegas, you know? You yeah. probably, your, your, your odds at Vegas are definitely better than investing in a startup. Um, invest because you believe in me. Invest because you believe in I don't know, whatever I'm, I'm, my service or product is in this grand vision, this ridiculous vision that wouldn't come true unless I had your help. You know, invest because you believe in that. Money will come because we want to build a great company. Um, that's what I tell folks. I don't know. Sometimes it works. <laughs> so, um, yep. Uh, you started Mystic when there were already two big companies doing wearables in the same space I basically had several... No, there were... So when we started... Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, the, if, if you were... I thought you were, like, already... Uh, they were already... Uh, big Competitors. So, mm -hmm. so, like, you know, the question is, what do we need another... Uh, yeah. How do you address so, that? So uh, I have two things to respond to on that. Um, first is uh, just a factual correction. The, there were... Uh, 18 competitors when we started the company. Okay. When we released the product, there were north of 40. Okay. And about a year into the first product release, we had around 80 to 100. And then by the time we exited, there were about 250 competitors, unique competitors with unique products, companies, 250 companies. Um, so it was even worse? Far worse, like an order of magnitude worse than what you were describing. Okay. okay. Um, but it just turns out that most companies suck. Okay, uh, most teams suck, and they're not hardcore. They're not, you know, the teams don't have coherent cultures. Uh, they're either incompetent or, inco or, or, or incoherent cultures, or they're very good at one thing but not a bunch of things. Um, or they're not well backed; they just run out of money. Or they're, they have a, a non-solid product vision, or they don't have product insight into something. Like, they just, I don't know. Just, most of them aren't that good. Um, but there were a select few, like. Fitbit, Jawbone, those were good. Those were strong competitors, really good. Garmin, you know, Xiaomi, and those are the ones that you worry about. And you and we thought of them in terms of the teams. Man, what's so good about those? Because you're really it's team against team, you know. Um, it's not just company against company. So we thought about like what's so good about that team that man we just got to be better or else they're going to wipe us out. Uh, so we thought about team versus team and what's missing from our team that can be better. Okay, um, but. To the second point was um, we're talking about competitors. In the, in the beginning, when you go asking for to raise money, oh, usually this is an issue. Yeah, like, you know, why yeah, yeah. You competitors. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, so I mean, highlighting how, how can you get a better team if you don't have the resources to to pay them? So yeah, um, I think having a very clear point of view and a clear point of differentiation, a differentiation, whatever that is. Um, helps, okay, so, um, and that leads to my second point, I remember my second point now, okay. that was, uh, um, so one thing I learned is, at least for me, what I want to do is, unless there's an obvious differentiator, technologically, business model, whatever, I don't really want to get involved in a company that doesn't have that. And at Misfit, you know, the in, because we lacked that differentiation in a number of areas, we suffered, and we had to work that much harder. Um, and Design was not enough? 
design was not enough. Design helped, you know, but man, we just had to work really hard. We had to raise a boatload of money. We had to raise, and raise it fast, and we had to get super aggressive with sales, and we had to um, create a, uh, an operational infrastructure that was much more efficient. So we did a bunch of stuff in Asia, so we grew faster. We had, uh, from, the, from, from when we started to three and a half years later when we sold, we had grew to 240 people. The only way we, we could afford that was by, and, and to be able to do that was doing it in Asia. Um, and so we just had to do all of that stuff because we didn't have, because there were certain aspects of our business model and product that wasn't sufficiently differentiated. It wasn't that we didn't have any differentiation, we did. We had, I think, better design than anyone else out there. We had better battery life than anyone else out there. But I think just those two is not, that's not enough. Um, we had to also do, get all that other stuff. Um, I think we probably have time for like two more questions. So, uh, new, new person, yep. Um, when it comes to the very early stages of a startup, when you have to approach a founder and uh, you have to make a presentation of your own product, yep. what are the top uh, mistakes you have to avoid? When uh, being a founder, or you are, uh, you want to make a startup. You have your own project, and you want to find the founder, investor, and investor. Sorry. Investor. Oh, oh, right. Um, okay. Yeah, fundraising. Yeah, man, that's like there's like a whole talk around that, right? <laughs> um, but uh, and so uh, earlier this morning, I mentioned one thing is don't send too much information, just just enough to get people excited, and then. Um, get it, um, set up a situation where they're pitching you, not the other way around, because if you pitch them, chances are one in 500, just like the other guy said, you know? Um, and so being able to construct that framework where they are coming to you. Um, I don't have a lot of specific advice on how to do that. There's like, I guess I do have a lot of specific advice. Most of it probably doesn't apply to you. Um, but think in that term, H how do you get inbound interest? And then you say, well, where you're trying to decide who to get investment from. I know that sounds ridiculous at this, at this stage, but it is possible. Like you, you can construct that scenario, but try to, it's easier to construct that scenario than pitching. Okay, pitching is one in 500. If you are able to construct that scenario, the odds are maybe, I don't know, one in 10, which is you know, 50 times better, right? So um, it's about creating intrigue. So one mistake to avoid, uh, create intrigue is your main job, not to communicate information. It's like in that first email, don't send that 20 page business plan. In fact, don't write a business plan, write a deck, you know, can, you know. And, uh, send, and don't send the whole 30 slides, send six. And uh, <coughs> very short email, bang, bang, bang points, interested? Let me know. And we're closing around soon, you know. Um, uh, mm, that seems to have worked better for me. Uh, other mistakes, uh, disclosing too much too early. Um, remember, as entrepreneurs versus uh, uh, investors, there is one thing we have that investors do not have. They've got money and power and connections, reputation, all that, so we're just a little, uh, you know. Um, so what do we have that they don't have? Any thoughts? Insight information. Insights. Okay. What was that? Easy. Content. Content. Okay. What, anything? What, what else do we as entrepreneurs have that investors don't have? That for sure. To make things. The ability to make things. Okay. Anything else? Passion. passion. Okay. Now there's a lot of passionate investors out there. Do you have a? Oh. Um, so um, the one thing we definitely have is information. Like before I meet. Mr. Investor, he does not know what I know, right? He does not know what I'm going to tell him, right? He might know about my domain better than what I do, but I, he definitely does not know what I'm about to tell him. So don't tell him. Um, <laughs> you know, the more, uh, so keep the information close to you. I, my, my thing, what I love to do is just being very guarded with the information and giving it as it's earned and really developing a relationship with the investor as opposed to saying, here's my 30 page <laughs> business plan. Surely there's something there that you like to invest in. <laughs> That's not a very compelling, but you know, if we develop a relationship, 
and you know, and you're like, oh, what else is there? Well, here, give me some more. Well, what? Oh, that's interesting. What's? Yeah, I'll give you some more and more. And then now we have a relationship. We have a communication. You're not just you know investor and you know uh, an entrepreneur. You're, you're you actually have a, a communication channel now. So using, does that make sense? Yeah. So that seems to have worked. Otherwise, you're just part of that one out of five hundred odds. And that the one out of five hundred odds is probably the guy who did that, developed that relationship, and you know, because the others didn't. Uh, one or two more questions. Yeah, gentleman in the back. Kind of combining this point to now also about yep. the timing right now of information. You had made a reference that there's a point where you could be at, a, you know, not every VC or every, every, every VC that the uh, funders may be for you, and you have the option yourself to then say no. You, you made a reference to it at the point where um, it's not always about asking and, and all the great, big, powerful thinking you help yep. us. Right. Can you, can you just maybe expand a little bit more on uh, maybe a situation where you had the opportunity, but you made a decision on culture or? or yeah, so. Um, Look, it is non-trivial. Your first, uh, like, I, I, let me let me fast forward a little bit and then answer your question. So it is very non-trivial to raise money. Okay, super hard. Venture capital is like it's like this crapshoot. You know, very hard. And especially if you're a first-time entrepreneur and you're doing the first round of financing, it is nearly impossible. It's very hard uh, to do it. So I don't I don't want to make light of that. I don't want to make it think like, oh, if you just do these things, you will get financing for your startup. <laughs> Not true, okay, it's, it's very hard. Um, what I'm saying is you can make it less hard by having this framework of uh, being focused on creating inbound situations, okay? Um, you know, we, we did have that at, in my previous startups. Um, wasn't because we were good, but I think it was because we were, we had very committed, very coherent culture around a team. And a, and a reasonably clear vision. Misfit's original vision was to create, uh, was to use uh, design to make technology beautiful or invisible. Okay, so uh, that was in, we were gonna do wearables, body, home, and car. Wearables, smart home, connected car. That was our vision, was to insert technology invisibly and beautifully into people's lives to make it useful. And so we had a fairly clear kind of thing that we went after. And we had a team of like five people that were pretty good, and then we went after that. Um, and we picked investors based on cultural fit to a large extent because we knew we had a good team, and that was what. And so, in, uh, focusing on your team—that's the other thing. A lot of times, people focus on like the idea or just the market. And you know, the best investors invest in teams. I, I, I actually, most investors invest on, in teams, and the best ones invest in, almost exclusively in teams. Like I know one, one of our investors basically said uh, that there's a set of people that they'll, they're gonna, they would invest in no matter what they did. As long as th those founders owned a certain percentage of the company, then they would just invest. Um, they might be exaggerating. You know, I don't know. Maybe I'll find out. But, the, uh, but some of the best investors invest in teams. Um, and so if you have a good team, you're going to get that. Um, let me throw out one litmus test in terms of selecting investors. So if you're in a, in a fortunate position where you, there are multiple investors who might be interested, uh, but this could apply to team members as well. Um, if you, uh, so you're deciding investor A or investor B, or investor A or not, or employee, key employee A or not, that might be a more relevant uh, metric. Imagine yourself in this situation Imagine yourself in a situation where you have screwed up, where, where there was a terrible, the, the company's in a bad situation. And you're in a bad, the company's in a bad situation because you did something really stupid. Just brain freeze and you just, you know, you just r really screwed up. Now, is the first thing that you do to say, man, how am I going to, how am I going to be able to tell Vasily that I, did this really stupid thing, you know, or that, that I'm the cause of that, this terrible situation. Or is your first thought to call them up and say, man, I really screwed up. Okay, let's work and figure out how to get through this, you know? Um, and if it's, the, if it's the former, don't work with that person. Investor, partner, or, or investor, or, or key employee, forget it. Uh, but if it's the latter, then I would, I would go for that. And, you know, we were fortunate of, to have someone like that. Uh, Brian from Founders Fund, he was, he was like that, you know, like when we screwed up, I didn't think, oh man, how am I going to tell Brian that I screwed up? First thing I did, call him up, said, hey man, and we, I, ro I royally screwed up. What do you think I ought to do? 
and he just and, he, and you know we brainstorm together. That's the kind of partner you want, right? All right, maybe one more. Let me let me see. Check on the time, and then uh, maybe the last one. One, one last question. Yep. Um, this lady here. Can I ask? You, uh, yep. Did you use benchmarking to find out what the competitors were doing and make like a similar product, or you try to be more innovative and do? Oh, we totally did. Oh, we totally benchmarked them. So we, uh, I read personally read nearly 5,000 reviews on Amazon. So of uh, Fuelban, Fitbit, and Jawbone, and uh, why things. 5,000 reviews. So you know how that number on the bottom of Amazon goes one, two, three, dot, 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 whatever. It went up to dot, dot, 173 pages for Fitbit. And I read every single one of them. Um, and that helped give me the, the product insights, get us as a team uh, insights into what to make and what not to make. It turns out that ugly, you know, people want more beautiful products. They hate to charge. They want durable products that are waterproof. You know, th th there was, it was very obvious, actually. So if you're doing a consumer product, uh, that's one way to kind of get some immediate feedback or some get, get, get you started is read Amazon reviews. I'm sure if, there's a, if you have an enterprise SaaS idea, you could go on Reddit forums maybe. or I don't know where you, but I'm sure there are ways, publicly available information that can give you that kind of feedback. All right, I think that's all the time we have for. Um, thank you for sitting through this and suffering through it with me. Um, feel free to email me if you have any, or WeChat. I don't know if any, anyone uses, anyone heard of WeChat here? Or one person, two, wow. Okay, so yeah, add me on WeChat. Uh, I live on it. Um, I use WeChat because Basically, it's available. You can talk to people in China because the other services are banned, and we do a lot of business in China. So, yep.